All right, um, kia ora, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Asha Sundaram, and I will be chairing uh, the session. I'm a senior lecturer in economics uh, at the University of Auckland. My research interests are in the areas of international trade and economic development. Uh, so I want to extend a warm uh, welcome to all of you in person and those who are joining us virtually um, to this session on local reflections of the global context. Um, we have an illustrious panel here. Um, we have Professor Natasha Hamilton Hart from the um, New Zealand Asia Institute, uh, Professor Rob Scully uh, from the APEC Studies Center. We have Professor Anna Strutt from the University of Waikato and uh, Rodney Jones from Wigram Capital Advisors. Um, Typically, uh, I quarrel with timetabling services here at the university to tell them do not put lecture slots at 2 p.m. because it's very hard to get points across when people are in the middle of their post-lunch slumber. But I'm not so worried today because I believe that we have an exciting panel. Uh, I think we're gonna, the next 45 minutes are going to be very energetic, uh, interesting, and insightful. Um, and I hope that you as the audience, both virtual and in person, are noting down your questions, uh, and I hope you make them provocative. We're gonna have some interaction um, at the end of the session. So rather than going into a long introduction of these panelists, I just wanna make it simple. Uh, I wanna say that the panel has wide-ranging expertise uh, in areas like political economy, trade policy, uh, not to mention their staggering grasp of uh, issues and concerns related to the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, so I'm very curious to, to see what they have to say. Let me thank Stephanie Honey and Rob Scully for the probing questions they asked Minister Hands and Wendy Cutler. Uh, what I want to do is just give you some of my brief takeaways uh, and questions before we hear from the panel. So it seemed to me that there are quite a few areas in the post-COVID world where countries might begin to work together. Uh, one was making trade work for the environment and the climate. The other that came through strongly was this idea of inclusive trade and making trade work for small businesses, uh, women's economic uh, empowerment. The third was digital trade, and it was heartening to see that uh, New Zealand was recognized as being at the forefront of digital trade with the DEPA agreement. In fact, both the US and the UK expressed uh, interest to potentially sign up or at least emulate uh, the DEPA agreement. That was quite heartening. And then a change in administration in the United States. Uh, it seemed to me, I heard words that I really liked. I heard words like predictability and, and certainty in trade policy, which uh, as research in economics tells us, uh, is very good for uh, international trade and growth. So of course we're gonna miss President Trump's uh, tweets every morning, however, certainty means firms can, can uh, deal with high tariffs, but what they cannot deal with is uncertainty in trade policy. So if we can get some certainty, I think that will be good for international trade. Now, I'm not one to end on a pessimistic note, but I did see some challenges ahead for the, the global trading system. Uh, I will outline four. Um, first, I think we have to face up to the fact that a new U a Biden administration does mean re-engagement However, I don't think it means business uh, back to usual. I don't think we're going back to where we were pre-COVID. Particularly, I can see uh, that there are going to be systemic reforms, potentially in the WTO, the CPTPP, RCEP. We're not sure where these, uh, these agreements are headed. Uh, the second is I heard a word that made me nervous, reshoring. Uh, this was mentioned in the context of medical supply chains, but I'm not sure if there is a broader context to this. At best, it may mean that countries will diversify their suppliers. At worst, it could mean protectionism. Third, the UK seemed focused on bilateral agreements rather than more multilateral uh, regional agreements. And that reminded me that the post-Brexit 
uh, trade order has uh, not yet shaken up. It, it hasn't shaped up. And finally, uh, dare I ask, what about the elephant in the room, or should I say the dragon in the room? Um, China. So what is China's role going to be in the post-COVID world? And more importantly, how are other players, uh, like the US, the UK, indeed Australia, New Zealand, going to work with China to ensure that trade works for everyone? So with that, I look forward to the panel's uh, insights, and then we will have an interaction at the end. Thank you, and welcome. Thank you very much, Asha, and, I, and my thanks also to the Public Policy Institute for organizing this amazing event. Um, I enjoyed the first two uh, keynote sort of scene setting speakers, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the program. Um, the two keynote speakers that you have just heard, I think they captured the most important issues on the trade agenda that we're all facing. Um, what are the pathways and what are the obstacles to achieving a trade policy environment that su supports sustainable and inclusive outcomes? So I want, um, in the seven minutes or so that I've got, to drill down into just two areas that I think present uh, obstacles. Um, so sorry if that sounds a little pessimistic, but I think we might as well face up to the obstacles that we probably face. And I'm going to focus on two areas in particular. One is distributional conflicts, and the other is what I would call a shadow of international security thinking that is now hovering over the trade agenda. So let me start with the distributional conflicts. Now, we all know that trade is an area that is meant to yield win-win gains. You expand the pie, the economic pie, uh, by trading with each other, um, and as a result, your economies become more efficient, more productive, and everyone is better off, or at least welfare has increased overall. Uh, but within that overall increase in welfare, of course, there can be plenty of disagreements about who exactly gets what. And therefore, when I listen to the, both the opening speakers talk about the importance of the rules-based trading system and the desirability of moving ahead with various kinds of agreements, whether that's on digital trade or trade in the environment, all these other things, um, it's important to remember that while we all benefit uh, from doing things about dealing with climate change in a way that is uh, going to be in a pro-trade way, um, the precise terms on which we do that are going to be keenly contested because the rules on any of these things are not neutral. Some players will uh, want one set of rules and another players will want another set of rules. Um, and so the Minister, Minister Hans, I noted, mentioned the digital services area as being one in which the UK favored uh, unencumbered e-commerce uh, and agreements that would not embed requirements for data sovereignty. But of course, precise, those are true areas that are going to be very difficult to find agreement on in this region where we have countries with very different understandings about what is an appropriate appro approach to data sovereignty um, or even whether you should uh, impose some kind of tax on digital trade. I noticed most recently uh, that there was a, a news report on uh, an e EU-US dispute over um, a French decision that they would in fact want to go ahead with uh, placing a charge on the revenues of e-commerce by players who um, have more than $750 million of revenue but no substantial presence in France. Now, the US, not surprisingly, said, what do you mean players that have, digital economy players that have more than $750 million in revenue but no substantial physical presence? That sounds like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and a few other US firms. And the US has strongly rejected the idea that there could be such an, a levy on e-commerce because it sees it as um, inimical to the trade agreements that it already has with the EU. So as these issues become to the, come to the forefront of the trade agenda, I think we can see more fights like that even in, in the digital space. I think the climate change issue is also one in which the distributional conflicts uh, are very much present and real. 
uh, Wendy Cutler in her uh, talk noted that there, there may be such, there may be consideration of some kind of an adjustment charge. And I, what she was referring to, I believe, was the idea that carbon intensive products that cross borders may face effectively a tariff on arrival uh, if they haven't been subject to some kind of carbon tax or um, equivalent cap and trade scheme in the country in which they were produced. Now, obviously, this is an area that I think New Zealand, although we claim to care very much about the climate crisis, um, would probably resist. And we only need to look at our own internal debate about how difficult it is to um, get agriculture into our ETS, our cap and trade system, to be, you know, to realize that those distributional conflicts about who exactly is going to pay for these inclusive, sustainable outcomes that we want to achieve through trade. The final one I'll mention on distribution is, of course, inequality is the um, come to the forefront uh, as a matter of concern in terms of not just a matter of how do we expand the pie through trade, but how do we divide it up? And if we are going to narrow gaps between those who have more and those who have less, then they, we can anticipate that this re redistributive agenda is going to um, be met with quite a lot of resistance and that we can expect to see that play out over the precise rules of trade agreements if we actually get to negotiate any. I will mention the, the shadow of international security because I think this is something that may actually make it hard to be negotiating trade agreements. And I'll start by noting that the US-China conflict has completely changed the tenor of international trade, the trade world. Um, we have gone from 30 years of most trade and commerce being conducted among countries that did not see each other as existential threats. So while there might be security-related sanctions on a few relatively marginal countries, such as North Korea um, or Libya or so on, we did not, the, the, the growth in world trade um, over the last 30 years, led by China joining the world trade system and the other countries of East Asia, these were, this was trade taking place in a context where nobody was a serious threat in security terms. Um, this has completely changed. Uh, senior members of the US foreign policy establishment, both the government, the executive, in Congress, and in the foreign policy community more generally, now regard China as an adversary. Um, China, for its part, um, has moved to become a much more wary and uh, determined uh, power in terms of thinking that it really does face a threat from the US and that it possibly, the risks of continued interdependence with the US are now being viewed by many in China as too great and China is clearly pushing ahead to it, uh, a much greater degree of technological autonomy. So we have both the US and China now viewing each other quite negatively and moving from a world of win-win, absolute gains, where you might find fight over the terms of your engagement, but you are not gonna fight over whether, whether one person should be winning at all. Whereas I think this has now um, become a, an increasingly difficult environment in which Trade, trade needs to take place, but we have two of the world's biggest economies now viewing each other in adversarial terms, and I think that will change many things. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Well, we had two really thought-provoking um, speakers. There's so much food, uh, food for thought that was given to us with particularly deep insights into the UK and the US perspectives, of course. What I'd like to do is just pick up on, on a couple of issues. Um, uh, in particular, I'd like to look at the shocks that COVID-19 has imposed on the global economy and how that has served to accentuate quite a few of the trends that we'd already been have, uh, seeing in the global economy. I mean, 2020, it really has been a year like no other, right? Uh, when I came to this meeting last year, I had flown in from China the night before. Uh, and of course, many of my colleagues were sitting around jet lagged. I don't think any of us have the jet lag excuse today. It's quite a different world that we're living in. Um, 
you know, the, the current cases of COVID-19 are just, are just huge, mind-boggling numbers. I think I read six, almost 65 uh, million global cases and one and a half million deaths globe, globe, um, worldwide. So absolutely unprecedented, having a huge impact on uh, almost every country in the world and, of course, the global trading um, system. Even before COVID-19, as our speaker, um, speakers mentioned, world trade was in a bit of trouble. Um, you know, we had a lower growth trend in trade after the global financial crisis. We've had increasing trade tensions that have manifested through a range of uh, tariffs and non-tariff barriers and so on. So we've seen this emerging over a period of time. COVID-19 came along with a huge additional blow to the global economy. Um, and uh, Minister Hans, in his, um, in his presentation, he talked about the, the greatest uh, decline in a quarterly growth in trade that we've seen, uh, and that was that 9.2% decline in trade that he talked about in the second quarter of this year. If we look at the estimates for the whole year, I think we're looking at about just above a 9% decline in world trade. Uh, if we look at GDP estimates, at the beginning of the year in January, the IMF was, was uh, projecting, a, I think, 3.3% growth rate in global production. It's now down to a contraction of 4.4% in, uh, in global production. And of course, unusually large risks um, remain. Some sectors of econ the economy we're well familiar with have been particularly harmed, but actually every sector of the economy has been harmed by the lockdowns, by the uh, cargo restrictions, by the um, planes, uh, the, the global flight schedules being canceled, and so on, significantly affected business activities and um, of course, international trade. So it's in that backdrop um, that I guess I, I was thinking about when I was listening to the presenters, the trends that we've seen in, in world uh, trade. Many of the trends that we've seen um, have been very much accentuated. So for example, uh, working from home, a lot of us became very familiar with that. Online education, uh, it was amazing how quickly Waikato University managed to turn our, our campus in China into online delivery and fairly soon afterwards all of our New Zealand campuses into online delivery. Things that we thought were impossible suddenly became uh, possible and happening. Um, access, you know, across the sectors we're seeing a shift to more digitization and we were seeing all of this happening before COVID but what COVID did was it really prompted a much greater um, stimulus in these sorts of activities. The shocks to the global economy, I just wanted to talk briefly about these. Um, the health shocks, of course, um, potential and actual health shocks that encourage governments to take countries into lockdown, really unprecedented situations. There were demand shocks. We're pretty familiar with demand shocks. We've seen them in past events like the global financial crisis, so we're kind of familiar with those. But in this case, we also got supply shocks. And in the past, when we've had supply shocks, they've typically come from things like natural disasters that are affecting just particular regions or countries. But what we saw this time was waves of supply shocks across, across the world. Quite unprecedented, particularly given the linkages, the complex linkages that we have between modern economies that disrupted global supply chains. So, you know, COVID has really brought these, the, these waves through of, of supply shocks. And the other shock I would mention is policy shocks, because of course governments have reacted to these um, various other shocks in the economy by a range of policies, uh, both domestically and internationally. And Minister Hans, in his, in his talk, he talked about the imposition of export restraints and um, reducing import barriers. We've seen lots of other countries do that as well, particularly for medicines, of course, um, medical equipment, but also for agricultural food, food goods. Um, kind of go in the opposite direction to what we usually do, in particular um, trying to stop exports and promote imports of these products. So that's kind of the, the, not the typical way that we see trade interventions being used in the past. Um, so that, that was kind of interesting. These trends, they've had a significant effect on the global economy. Uh, I mentioned implicitly the complexity of global supply chains that we're well familiar these, uh, with these days. Um, Minister Hans, he talked about um, countries that sought, to, or his country, seeking to promote resilience. Uh, and he mentioned those worrying words. Natasha, you picked up on, on some of them. Um, I think he used the words onshoring, nearshoring, regionalism, and so on, which can be quite, um, I, sorry, it was, it was Ashley that picked up on those ones. Um, 
even before COVID, it was clear that supply chains were undergoing a transformation. Um, things like lean, you know, with the risks in the global economy, things like lean delivery, just-in-time delivery, these sorts of things uh, were looking too risky. They didn't have enough provision to cope with risk even before then. So what we've seen with, with COVID is, is, is a move towards, uh, I guess, um, even further accentuating those shorter, faster supply chains, diversification of, um, of suppliers and so forth, increased digitization. I mentioned earlier things that we never thought were possible suddenly became possible. Uh, we might also think about things like globotics, and you might recall those of you who were here last, uh, last year, Richard Baldwin talked about these sorts of issues where you've got um, globalization and robots moving together to put in place um, provision of services um, remotely that we never thought were possible before. And you can imagine COVID could give a further stimulus to those sorts of things. So we find ourselves in this very dynamic, challenging global environment. Uh, I think both Wendy and Greg articulated that um, really clearly in their presentations. At this time, it might be tempting for businesses and governments to look inward to try to do things within the domestic economy. Indeed, Wendy um, did note that the Biden administration will focus on bringing manufacturing back to the US. Um, but an inward focus leads to potential loss of opportunities, um, potential loss of efficiency, and potential loss of resilience. Um, so it's a, you know, I guess it's a worrying um, shift that we, that we saw in, in that. For businesses, if you only focus on a domestic market, you risk uh, concentrating risk, losing economies of scale and so forth. Uh, working to diversify markets seems a much better option, particularly for, I guess, businesses from New Zealand, a relatively small economy. So governments are going to respond to challenges in different ways, and we've seen a, a range of these different um, responses. It was reassuring to see both of the speakers emphasize the importance of rules in international trading systems. Um, but of course, uh, trade is needed to ensure that the, the world of the ho as a whole also gains access to the medical treatments um, and so forth that we need, not to mention those vaccines that we're waiting for. So just on a final um, point, um, mention was made by both speakers of the importance of a diverse range of um, issues. Uh, and I haven't touched on those. It's not that I don't think they're important, things like uh, sharing the gains from trade and so on, but I'm really excited to see we've got some great sessions coming up later, so I'm really looking forward to more discussion of those. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, my thanks also to the Institute of Policy Studies for um, putting on this uh, wonderful event. Um, we've already had some very interesting discussions, I think. And uh, listening to Wendy when I talked to her certainly didn't change my view, and I think Natasha obviously shares the same view, that the US-China conflict is going to continue to be a dominating factor in our international relations, um, including in trade for some time to come, maybe for the foreseeable future. And my related view, um, that for this and other reasons, the world has become a distinctly more dangerous place for a small country like New Zealand. And if I could illustrate that with a trade example, we go back to the phase one agreement between China and the US at the beginning of the year, the truce, if you like, in the trade war between them. Part of the deal was an undertaking by China to purchase very large quantities of agriculture and other exports from the US, um, a commitment that it could only fulfill by substantially cutting back its imports from other countries, including New Zealand. In practice, that didn't happen, fortunately, um, mainly due to COVID and also to the fact that the US farmers couldn't actually supply the quantities required. Um, but the intent was clear, a deal to suit the Chinese and US interests and hurting many other countries. And commenting on this deal, um, Edward Alden, a senior fellow at the US Council for Foreign Relations, uh, said um, that the US previously, um, as he noted, a champion of the rules-based trade system, was now discarding it in favour of a power-based system where the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must, which, as many of you will know, is actually a reference to the famous Melian dialogue in Thucydides, the Greek historian, who um, I think Van Gillis, if he's here, has often quoted in the past. <laughs> um, it's not the, he's not talking about the, the famous Thucydides trap, which can catch the superpowers. He's talking about the position of the small states caught in the crossfire between the two superpowers. 
And I think the current Australia-China fracas could well be a modern case in point of what can happen in these circumstances as a result of misjudgments made in different capitals. Um, turning to the other superpower, let me say at once that along with millions of others, um, I was extremely happy that um, Mr Biden won the US presidential election. Relieved, I might say. Um, but it's also clear that the China-US conflict will not go away as a result of that. Uh, uh, President-elect Biden has been emphatic that he intends the US to resume world leadership and that he will deploy that leadership to build a coalition of allies against China. And we have to ask what pressures will be brought to bear on the putative allies in that coalition and will those who stand aside from the, alli from the alliance metaphorically suffer the same fate as the Melians in, the, in Thucydides? There are also several elements of continuity with the Trump trade policy in Biden's stated approach to trade. He's reported recently as describing his priority of bringing manufacturing back to the United States, which we heard about, as an America first policy, which I have to say I shuddered when I heard that. Um, and Wendy Cutler did make quite clear that the Trump tariffs are not likely to be quickly re reversed. So if we're looking at US trade policy, I think a key question there, as in many other areas, is can we regard Trump as an aberration, which is now going to be discarded? Or has he simply been a symptom of a deeper malaise affecting the United States? And if that's the case, can President Biden actually rise above that malaise? Um, in relation to the WTO, we can all accept that there certainly can agree with Wendy that there can be no going back to the WTO exactly as it was before. The imperative for reform is far too strong for that. But what changes will the United States be willing to accept? And we have to note that the United States under Trump essentially placed itself outside the reach of multilateral trade rules. Will it be ready, will it be willing under Biden to give up this newfound freedom? I think that's going to be a critical question um, when we look at what will happen in the WTO under, with, with the Biden presidency. What did Wendy Cutler mean? I didn't have time to ask her this when she said, that if the United States sought to rejoin the CPTPP or the TPP, it would not be satisfied with simply writing back the provisions that were suspended when the US withdrew, but would insist on negotiations to add new provisions, um, maybe taken from the USMCA, the NAFTA Mark II. Did she actually mean by that, was she referring to the poison pill that was inserted in the USMCA with the idea of preventing the partners from entering, any, enter, entering into any trade deals with China? So we are, I think, have some, a lot of questions that are going to be answered as we go forward, um, or as the Biden administration goes forward. And from New Zealand's point of view, I would argue that a key consideration for us is going to be the reaction of countries in East Asia, which is where we know that New Zealand's economic future increasingly lies, and where, the t where um, in terms of trade, um, the East Asian countries, including New Zealand and Australia, who are part of it, are being brought closer together by the RCEP big feature of the RCEP it is it brings the whole of East Asia and Australia and New Zealand together, closer together, by establishing a single set of rules for the region. And East Asia um, has this same issue of being caught in the crossfire between the United States and China, and the East Asian countries have repeatedly told the United States and China that they don't want to be forced to be taken, to take sides between them. And I think there are plenty of indications to indicate that if they were forced to take, to, 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 they were forced to choose, sorry, if they were forced to take sides, they would not all choose the same way. And that would create all kinds of issues for New Zealand if different countries in East Asia sided with one and others sided with the other. So let me move away from some of those maybe not so optimistic thoughts to APEC next year. Um, is it possible that New Zealand could bring the two superpowers together, given that both China and the United States will be in the room along with the other APEC members when we meet through the APEC year, virtually. Um, uh, and you, you heard what Wendy Cutler had to say about that, and in the part of the conversation that wasn't in the recording, she also said that she felt that New Zealand was in a, in a unique position to play the part of the bridge between China and the United States, because New Zealand, as she put it, has good relations with China and the United States. Um, and she went on to say, in fact, that if New Zealand couldn't bring them together, nobody could. So no pressure then. Um, and then finally, if I can end on a more optimistic note and recognising all of the difficulties that Natasha talked about in relation to climate change, the distributive consequences and the issues that will come from that, um, 
I think one area where you can see a clear opportunity for the US and China to come together on a basis of common interest is surely in climate change policy. I mean, given that China, along with Japan and Korea, and of course the European Union, have all recently announced target dates that they intend to meet for achieving carbon neutrality. And we have heard President-elect Biden say that one of his first actions will be, day one when he assumes the presidency, will be to rejoin the Paris Accord. So given that, can we expect a Biden lead the United States to do the same? It won't be easy, given the state of US politics, but let's hope so, and let's also hope that in the coming APEC year, um, APEC, and with New Zealand hosting it, can make a contribution towards bringing the region um, towards a um, sustainable uh, position on climate change and decarbonisation. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a privilege to be here. I actually studied trade and macro under Rob nearly 40 years ago. So um, at, at, the, <laughs> at the end of that time, um, I thought I'd take a year off and go and work in Asia rather than going on to do a PhD um, and went for a year or two and stayed for more than 30. I'm now back in New Zealand but never made it back to university. But um, as a kind of on-the-ground practitioner, having spent a lot of the time, I mean, hearing Wendy speak, that was a fantastic interview. Wendy Cutler reminds you of what we miss this year, that ability to interact with global policymakers and really you know, debate these, these global issues. So it's great to be here. It, it's, you know, what we've seen in the last few days is, um, with regard to China and Australia, is we've seen China imitating Trump in some ways via tweet, and tariffs in that sort of, that coarsening of the global discourse and providing a sense that maybe we won't get back to where we were, that Biden's election is not a restoration, that we're dealing with a very different world. But what came out of listening to Wendy Cutler is that we're also going to have the US imitating China. That what China may have had with Made in China 2025 which is the precursor to Xi Jinping's dual circulation, which I'll go into, the US has buyback America. And this is what we really have is, we talk about US China, but we also have both turning inward now, the onshoring of manufacturing. We're not gonna get back to, to, to where we were. And, and so that's why it was striking. I mean, Wendy Cutler kind of, you did your interview before, Biden's interview with the New York Times where he said the tariffs won't be coming off, the tariffs are gonna stay on. And at the same time though, China has not complied with the deal. I mean, you, you do a line, I'd love to have a chart here, but if you do a line, the deal was for an increase in US imports, and imports from the US, and instead it's flat. China has not increased buying. So if anything, the risk going forward is that we get more tariffs between US and, and China. And the reason I say that is that China is very clearly turning inward. And the dual circulation theory is something we should take seriously. We tend, they tend to come out with these phrases in English and we kind of ignore it or shrug it off. It's something we should take seriously because it reflects China turning inward, prioritizing domestic manufacturing, prioritizing domestic production, prioritizing buying from Chinese firms rather than foreign firms. And for New Zealand, that's going to represent a challenge that our producers and exporters will have to rise to. We see examples like kiwifruit um, with Zespri doing a great job of, of, of doing that and coming up with strategies. But this is going to be kind of our world going forward. The other aspect of this that we have to consider is that this expansion of surpluses in Asia. Now, if we look at China's goods and services surplus, dual circulation implies a larger external surplus. So already China's running a goods and services surplus of something like $40 billion a month this year, $500 billion. So we're looking at China that for a long time had been running down to a zero current account balance applauded by the IMF, will now be running a much larger external surplus. And that's going to impose challenges and encourage both the EU and the US to turn inward if they can't get resolution to that. So we're really post COVID, you know, you have these global pandemics and back and, and back over a thousand years, they never leave the world the way it was 
And that's what we have to assume with, the, with, with COVID, that it's exacerbated this strain, these strains. And one of the strains we've really seen emerge, and, and we're part of this region. So when RCEP was announced, I thought we'll go and look at the data and we'll see what the RCEP surplus was. So we threw in Australia and New Zealand to the RCEP countries in Asia. Now that trade surplus of aggregate RCEP with the rest of the world is now approaching a trillion dollars. It was 800 billion with the surge in um, trade that's happened this year. It's approaching a trillion dollars. And the, the interesting thing is that if you um, look at the supply chains, because Asia contained the virus, workplace mobility in Asia is largely unchanged from pre-crisis. It's down a bit. If you need to get goods, you buy them from Asia. The containers, Asia produces a container, the shipping lines are moving. You can move goods both to Europe and to the US from Asia. And so if we look at Asian trade, we've had now we've had five big downturns in the last 25 years, starting with the Asian crisis. This is actually the most modest. Asian trade looks like it would only contract 3% this year, trading goods, just 3%. Even for New Zealand, of all our trade shocks in the last 25 years, starting with the Asian crisis in 98, this is the most modest. And that's, but as uh, I think um, Minister Hans was saying, he was quoting numbers like a 9% contraction. Now that reflects again this reorientation towards Asia. So we're going to have Asian imbalances more acute than at the start. And in some ways, uh, uh, New Zealand is, is, is now part of the problem region. We don't sit outside. We're actually part of the problem region, which is this Asia Pacific, not Indo Pacific, Asia Pacific, because India sits outside this trade block. A Asia Pacific is still the right terminology to think about these kind of global global Im Im imbalances. And, and that brings me to that, uh, to an important point in terms of the impact of climate change strategies and what it means for New Zealand. And this is something that you know, I've been thinking about, but I hadn't thought about it from a New Zealand perspective, sitting you know, in Beijing for the last decade and tending to look things through that US-China prism. Is a border adjustment tax, is that adjustment tax that Wendy Cutler referred to? And that's something we really have to consider in a New Zealand strategy that this, I expect, given these trillion dollar surpluses that the RCEP countries are running, that will come to the fore as part of a climate strategy. And what is that? That means that goods will be assessed for their carbon content. Countries will either join, will join an agreement, probably led by the United States, and then that region will have a border adjustment tax where you lever a tariff on goods according to the carbon tax. And this is where the role that we've had, been able to play for the last 30 years, is going to be more challenging going forward because we get this divergence of interests. We see our interests with the West. Our economic interests are firmly with the Asia Pacific. And, and this is going to represent an enormous challenge as we, as we look forward. All right, thank you very much to the panel for your insights. Um, I want to open the floor to questions. Yep, there we go. Hello, um, kia ora. Um, my name is Nick Black. I work in the services and digital trade team at MFAT. Um, and first, I'd just like to thank um, the panel for being here and for your insightful remarks um, so far. Um, especially with Rob and Asha, who I was studying under two years ago, or one year ago, one year ago. Um, one, of, one of New Zealand's responses to this um, turbulent times um, in trade seems to be our, our strategy of concerted open pluralateralism, um, where we work with a small group of like-minded countries um, to, uh, to pursue um, more ambitious trade rules. Um, and I'm... I'm for example, we've got the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, which is a great agreement, um, as well as with our uh, sustainability lens today, the um, Agreement on Climate Change, Trade and Sustainability. Um, I'm just wondering if the panel um, has any views on this, this strategy of concerted open pluralateralism. 
um, and how it m might be effective or, or not effective um, to combat um, the, the context we have today. Thank you. Um, do you want to? Yeah, okay, that's working. Um, well, I'm personally actually a big fan of open plurilateralism, and I think I think I say that in relation to the two agreements we have in the Asia Pacific region. Um, the RCEP and the CPTPP, and I would be very much in favour of efforts to um, to widen the membership of both those agreements because um, while they are different, and you can argue one is better than the other or whatever, but they are both an expression of the willingness of the members to work together around a common set of rules and a common set of understandings of how trade should be expanded, and we don't see that very much elsewhere in the world at the moment. And maybe, maybe you could say the European Union is the other exemplar of that. Um, but I think that expanding both of those agreements to uh, countries who would uh, like to join and willing to sign up to the terms and conditions, I think would be a very positive thing. And we've seen a number of countries indicate that they were interested in joining both of those agreements. Um, the one sort of other comment I would make, though, is that, again, the US-China um, situation does loom large because in the US MCA, the United States insisted on inserting a condition that says essentially that if either US, if Canada or Mexico enter into a free trade agreement with China, they can lose their benefits under the US MCA. And if that was going to be the US condition going forward, for example, if it rejoined the CPTPP, then that would be quite a big spanner in the works. On the other side of the question, we've heard President Xi Jinping say at the APEC CEO summit the other day, that China would be interested in joining the CPTPP, which from one point of view I think would be an excellent thing to happen because if China was prepared to sign up to the conditions and terms of the CPTPP, that would go quite a long way to answer the um, concerns that many other countries have about China's willingness to abide by a high standard of trade rules. But because, again, of the situation between the China and the, U and, and the US, a move by China to join the CPTPP would obviously raise quite considerable problems and um, might uh, actually uh, provoke a situation which might be unhelpful rather than helpful. Any other questions? Uh, I'm Kelly Gart, and I'm actually from the School of Population Health at the University of Auckland. And um, so not usually my crowd. Um, <laughs> but basically, so COVID-19 COVID has demonstrated the value of strong and decisive government action for prevention of infectious disease, but the same is true for chronic disease. And um, the current trajectory of international trade and investment agreement seems to be towards restricting the ability of governments to regulate products and industries behind the border, uh, particularly for harmful products like alcohol and junk food, and all in the name of harmonization and removal of unnecessary barriers. And when we talk about inclusive development, this also means enacting appropriate measures to curb the massive influx of transnational unhealthy products into emerging economies and into indigenous communities and higher deprivation neighborhoods, right, in countries like New Zealand. So my question to the panel, sorry for the long setup, is do you see any opportunities in the current context to ensure that the negative health impacts of international trade are being appropriately managed in our, in our trade negotiation policy? Let me give you a very short answer and possibly um, you might have some extra things to say. But I, I think that um, there has probably been unnecessary concern about the potential for PDAs to erode public health uh, standards that has arisen because of a few celebrated cases, you know, the Philip Morris suing the U, um, Australian government. And obviously that was one that in the end, Philip, Morris lost, but it was widely noted that had they taken the case or threatened to take the case against a much smaller 
less resourced government, it might well have seen been a deterrent to, to public health regulation. However, my impression is that um, agreements that are currently being negotiated um, do not have nearly such intrusive ISDS provisions in them and have quite strong carve-outs for public health protection. Um, so I, I don't want to say it's entirely yesterday's issue, <laughs> um, but I, I think that there, there seems to be a very widespread recognition that, you know, government regulation isn't going away. It is a matter of finding common grounds for health and safety, and, and this is, this, you know, a long jurisprudence in the GATT and onwards about what constitutes reasonable um, health and safety grounds uh, for regulation, what the rules should be. Did, did you want to...? Rob was agreeing with, with those, those comments there. I guess the only thing that I'd add to that is just that um, the current situation has actually shown us the importance of trade flows for solving some of the health problems um, and having access to the PPE, having access to um, treatments, and of course that much anticipated um, vaccine. And it worries me greatly that the most vulnerable um, countries and people are the ones with the least access to that trade and those products that we all need. And we need it through international trade. And, you know, there's no one country that can produce all of these things that we need. So it's it's slightly tangential to your um, question, but I, it is something that's been worrying me greatly in, in recent times is, is access of people to proper trade flows. And we saw terrible situations of, well, you know, as I talked about, blocking exports is not usually the way that we say, see countries behaving uh, when they're taking trade measures. Um, but that's what we, you know, we're sort of seeing this reversal and it's actually harming people. So um, it, it's, a, it's a balance, it's a balance, but um, that's just something that's on my mind, I guess, at the moment. Did you want to add, Rob? I think we're almost um, out of time. So what I'm going to suggest is that we close and then, um, of course, the panelists are going to be around and you can always talk to them um, off the floor. So thank you, everyone, and I look forward to the rest of um, uh, the sessions. Uh, hopefully you'll be with us tomorrow as well. Thank you very much.